Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. You're listening to the Think Unbroken podcast, and I'm your host, Michael Unbroken. I'm an author, speaker, coach, and advocate for adult survivors of childhood trauma and abuse. In this podcast, you will learn how to transform your trauma into triumph, turn breakdowns into breakthroughs, and go from victim to being the hero of your own story. You can learn more at thinkunbrokenpodcast.com, and of course, check us out on Apple Podcasts and Spotify at Think Unbroken Podcast. What's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. I'm very excited to be back with you with another episode. My guest, Shamicha Gonzalez. What's up, my friend? How are you today? I am doing good. I'm so grateful to be here. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate you coming to hang out with me, be in the studio, and have this conversation. Um, we connected. I was hosting. I was hosting. I was judging um, one of Grant Cardone's speak-offs during the 10X Growth Conference here in Vegas in... February? Yeah, it was Valentine's Day. So February. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you were competing with uh, a few powerhouse speakers, a couple of which yeah. I know personally. And just in a couple of minutes, your story was powerful and captivating. And I was like, this is someone I want to sit down and talk to and have a conversation with because what you do now is beautiful, but the path that you've led to get to where you are is one that I think warrants a, a deep conversation. And so yeah. thank you so much for being here. Oh, no, you're welcome. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So let's start here. What's something that I need to know about your past to understand and know who you are? Hmm. So for myself, I would say that I was a small town country girl with a really big dream. Um, that meaning I had been through a lot of adversity, but a lot of what I did was in innocence. And so I didn't know that I was born with crack in my system. I didn't know that I was poor or adopted or a foster child. I just knew I loved life and it was this thing inside of me that just allowed me to be who I was. And that was energetic, fun, smart, um, very outgoing. And I love to talk. Like people's favorite thing to tell me was like, Shemitra, shut up. Like during the movies. During... <laughs> but that is what allows me to be who I am now is that innocence and that 
that love and that energy that I always had uh, through all of my adversities, through everything I'd been through. I was born in the country. I played outside. I didn't wear shoes. I was very humble. But I also didn't know all the bad stuff that people put on me as I got older. So I, I actually did have in my mind a pretty good upbringing. Although to other people, you know, when I tell my story, it's a bit much for them. Sometimes I even have to tell them, you know, take a second to just, you know, take a deep breath because you might be triggered by some of the stuff that I've been through. But, you know, I'm here for you and it's a safe space for us to talk about this because I don't tell everybody. So when I have those conversations, I always lead with that because I know other people may not have that strength of what I have that have been or maybe they never shared their story or maybe they don't know how to, you know, even accept their story. But I found out my story later down the line from other people. <laughs> I always thought I was great. Yeah. Yeah. There's what comes to mind, and I don't think contextually it fits, but this is what yeah. comes to mind, uh, the idea that ignorance is bliss, right? And, and in that, the ignorance being of the unknowing, not lack of, yeah. not lack of education or, or intellect, but just yeah. knowing something different. Right. Yeah. And and that played a big role in my life, like growing up being, you know, a, in a super abusive home, drug addict, alcoholic mother, mm -hmm. absent father, abusive stepdad and me being like a drug addict when I'm 12 years old. I look at that and I'm like, well, I didn't know any. Right. But yep. it's the ignorance of the society that I grew up. In. Wow. And what was fascinating in my journey, I, I like started to slowly unravel things. I was like, why is my life a disaster? And it's like, you look at the dominoes, you roll them backwards. You're like, well, yeah. this is a problem. Growing up, and, I mean, and, and, you know, mentioning it being a small town, do you yeah. feel like people were intentionally protecting you from what was happening? Hmm. So I would say it was insidious, if that's the word for it. Um, they were all protecting themselves. Um, it was very drug, it was very drug addicted, very small country town. Um, a lot of tickling and like touching, you know, um, I always would dress myself as a boy, like, and try to look masculine and not pretty. Cause I, everyone, every day I'm like, she's so pretty. I was a mixed breed girl as you, <laughs> you know, I'm black and Spanish, but on one side, I lived with all black people. And then on the other side, I lived with all Spanish people. So I was the different person in each group. So I got a lot of attention. And because I was always living with different families and kind of here and there, people, I never had that protection of a mother cub to like, or a mother to protect her cub, to be like, you know, don't do this or, you know, don't touch her like that or don't do like, I just was free. So it just didn't feel right, a lot of the stuff that would happen to me. So when I think of protection, I think the church protected me. I think the school protected me. Um, I grew up in Texas. Texas has an amazing school system. They have an amazing social work system. They have an amazing system for um, children athletic-wise. I was an athlete, too. So those systems protected me. My family, and I love and adore them. They, You know, my mom was in and out of my life. My dad tried to come and get me when he would be sober. Both of my parents were addicted to drugs as well. I was born with crack in my system. So from the womb, again, I didn't really know nothing was wrong with that, but I knew that I was different. And that's, people would make jokes like she got, you know, that's why she got all that energy. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Or my grandmother would say stuff like, you hot, are you fast? And I'm like, I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> I just, but as I got older, I started to see that I was a beautiful young girl. I was curvaceous. I had long, pretty hair. And that brought a lot of attention. And with that type of attention, it actually shut me away from everybody. And I would try to cover myself and be as small as possible. So that was actually harder for me than just to be me. But I did that because I didn't feel protected. I felt like predators were all around me at all times, no matter what shelter, what house, what family side of the family because if you're not there all the time you're just a, a little girl like they don't have love for you they don't know you so that that's kind of where that goes but I definitely will say I I appreciate the systems that were put in place in Texas that I, that I emancipated myself at 15 you know that's because my social worker told me how to get out the system because I did that I was you know trafficked I know part of my story is that I was trafficked and um, that's because after I emancipated myself, there was no more social workers looking after me. There was no more, you know, kind of going back and forth to they would give us they would uh, basically the judge said I would have to 
um, have a job and provide for myself. That was it, though. So if you can prove that, you're grown legally in the court's eyes. So I signed myself into school, got a job, and, you know, I was I, I started kind of speaking up a little bit more. And that's when I got, you know, introduced to some women that brought me into the life of being trafficked. And that's when the drugs started. I never did drugs because I saw what it did. I, I, I didn't want that for my life. I was a student athlete, but without anybody watching over me, I everything that like spiraled out of control was because I did not have somebody to just care. Yeah. We're, we're going to go down that path a little bit deeper in, in a moment. Yeah. I want, I want to go to something that, and this is, this is for me kind of a personal journey that's been both simultaneously difficult, but like the very thing that's probably led me to where I am today. Yeah. And that's growing up biracial. And one of the things mm -hmm. that people, generally speaking, unless you grew up biracial, you don't understand mm -mm. is that you live in two different worlds. Yes. And so here on one hand, I'm like growing up in the hood uh, around and, you know, very, like, really imagine, I mean, drugs, alcohol, yeah. gambling, stealing, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the whole thing. And then on the other side, it's like I've been called both black trash and white trash, which is really fair. Thing. Man. <laughs> so like growing, growing up biracial is incredibly tumultuous experience yeah what what and this is for me yeah yeah on one hand i have my grandmother who's white and i've shared this many many times on the podcast yeah was very racist i wasn't even allowed mm. to have like, people in my a copy of hitler's autobiography mein Kampf in our kitchen right and that's comp my uncle's in the area and brotherhood Jesus. i mean it just keeps going and going yeah and, going. and so i obviously had a massive identity crisis as a kid mm -hmm. that's why i started doing drugs when i was 12. wow what, what was growing up biracial like for you i would say growing up biracial for me was a lot of name calling um wet back on one side of it um blacky on the other side of it um the way they did it I laughed at it because I didn't see that it was mean or deceitful, but I didn't know Spanish people could be racist against blacks. Now, I mean, for myself, we're the same. Like, I literally saw two different cultures. Um, the white families that I was with, I was born, like I said, with a lot of complications and I was dyslexic and I had all these problems. So I would get more checks than the other kids. So I was always the kid who everybody wanted. In context checks, I know what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so when you are a ward of the state, a foster child, when you are a part of a system, you get paid by the state. Whoever adopts you or takes you in gets paid from the state for you. So whatever they need to take care of you, they get food stamps, they get Medicaid for you, they get a check. If you're sick, they get a check. If you need extra care, they get a check. So it, it could be a, a, a money thing. But for someone like myself, once I realized that that was happening, that's why I emancipated myself. I'm like, I could get my own checks. Oh, what? Because I had a social worker who I was explaining my story to. And she was like, if they're not taking care of you, you're very smart. You're beautiful. You're talented. You're a great athlete. You're on student council. You can take care of yourself better than someone else just taking your money. So when I say a check, that's you know, kind of what I'm referring to. But for that reason, I don't think I experienced as much as hard of a life as other kids did. But I always felt over-sexualized, one, because, you know, black and brown women are a little bit more curvier. Like, I'm a Texas girl. I was, you know, really voluptuous. And so I felt that that was always something that was put in there. And then, like, back in the day, culturally, for those who don't understand, the, the black culture, um, they would have songs like, she's a bad yellow bone. You know, Lil Wayne would say stuff like, yeah, I got a black girl, but she would look better red. So there was this like turmoil with black girls. Like they, mm. it was, this, it was like colorism back in the day during slavery time when it was the br brown paper bag society. You know, if you if your skin is the color of a brown paper bag, you could be a part of this. But if not, you a house, you know, you can't be in the house. So you had slaves that were outside slaves, and then you had slaves that were inside slaves. Like, all of this stuff I learned as a grown woman, but I experienced as a child. I had no idea what it was until I was like, dang, that's why they felt like that about me. Or, like, someone cut my hair. Like, I, I was sitting in my chair at school, and, you know, they have the chairs that, like, you, they have, like, um, it's like a hole in between it, and, like, you sit down. So my hair would always hang out the back, 
And like they would always tie my hair to the back of the chair. So I would like, you know, I tried to like tuck my hair away. So then I would just like take it and put it over the chair and not behind the chair. And one of the girls, she was mean and she cut my hair mm. and like everybody laughed. And she was like, your hair will grow back. I'm just like, like, what, what did I do to you? But it definitely was something that, oh man, I wouldn't want anybody to go through it. Um, especially not somebody who doesn't have thick skin or kind of play everything off and like laugh at it. But it was really hard for me. It was hard. I know people, you could say what they want, whatever, but it made me feel like I didn't belong anywhere. Yeah. And that's probably why when predators came to me and told me I could be a part of a family, I felt like I could belong. Yeah, I, I get that a lot. And, you know, I always felt, and probably even to this day, where I didn't fit in with the black kids because I was too white, and then the white yeah. kids, I'm too black. I identify as biracial. Period. Yeah. If that's one's like, you're black, you're white. I'm like, no, I'm fucking biracial. I'm biracial. <laughs> I've gone to war with people on this. Yeah. Right? It's, and it's, Oh, like you go fill out these forms for the taxes, what like biracial is not on there, mm -mm. you know, and it, it says other, it's the other, right? And I'm like, okay, that's how I've always felt my whole life. I'm the yeah. other to you, right? And wow. I, one of the things that is is near and dear to my heart is is just having this conversation for people who are biracial because we, as we continue to progress in society, there will just be more and more and more biracial, multiracial people. That is true. And and that is a really beautiful thing. But it is. you know, being you know, the kind of the, the cornerstones of this experience is yes. it's been a war. Like yeah. that's the thing I, I I try to convey to people is like they don't understand unless they are biracial. Yeah. What it's like to be ostracized over something you don't have control of. At, at all. least if you're and I, I say this in jest, but I'm like, if yeah. you're a full breed, you don't know what you're, you don't right. know at the border all. Right. You don't know what it's like to wake up in the morning and have this massive identity crisis. Yeah. When you were young, and, and those moments, like that girl did, is absolutely tremendously horrible. And I think about that. It's like, we're easy targets. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons why you're an easy target. Yeah. Foster kid, adopted, drug addict, alcoholic, mother, parents. Yep. Be this person who... It's still striving, so you probably have a little bit of like nerdiness and overachiever yeah. to you. It resonate with so many of those elements. Yeah. And so even though I'm six foot four, I'm twenty, <laughs> like fought like hundreds of times in school, Jeez. being a target, just because of the way that you know, being the poorest kid in the school, yeah, is the target, especially at the poorest school. I mean, it's very yeah. evident I'm wearing shoes from Goodwill when I'm like in you know, tenth grade. And so I, I think about that, and there's this element of resilience. Mm -hmm. And this is the one thing that probably has been the cornerstone that has projected me to where I am today. Yeah. When you when we're young, we have no idea. You're just like, I'm just gonna survive. This. Yeah. And then when you become older, it becomes this amazing, amazing tool if you're able to leverage it. Yes. But now here you are getting into 15 years old, you've made an incredibly difficult decision. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you're deciding to take control of your life at 15 years old getting kicked out of school for selling drugs, right? And wow. so what I'm curious about, where where did that decision come from for you? Like, if, if you mm -hmm. once sit down, was there an experience, multiple experiences? I remember kids emancipating themselves, and I even researched yeah. myself when I was, like, what? 16. <laughs> and I was just, like, I just, I guess I didn't really get it then. Yeah. But what happened in your life where, like, I'm actually going to do this thing? Yeah. Oh, man. So, I mean, tr truthfully, so I was a part of student council. I was a part of volleyball, basketball, track. Um, I had won like like a uh, homecoming queen because I think that was the year be after eighth grade. Eighth grade, I had won like homecoming queen. So like eighth grade was the best year of my life. <clears throat> I felt like I could do anything. I felt like I was on top of the world. And I've had one person who listened to me and she was my social worker at the school. And um, she motivated me. She told me to read books. She told me that I'm not tangential, that I'm important. And I didn't know what that word meant, but I, I looked it up and I'm like, oh, that means that I, I'm not just something that could be replaced. Like I am somebody. Like I'd never had somebody pour into me the way she did. And so she would put these ideas in my head of like, I could do it, you know, and I could be better and I could make this happen. So 
I like to tell people, all you need is one person, one person to care, one person to show you a route, one person to give you an idea. And it's based on you. But because of what that seed is that she planted, it changed my life. And granted, mine was also a little motive. You know, it's not all peachy creamy. It was kind of like, I'm going to prove y'all wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, you ain't getting no more money off of me. Like, yeah. So it was like, you know, like, so I don't really show that side too much, but it was definitely when I was 15, it was kind of like, you know, like, watch. Kind of that Cardi B, like, "Mm, I'm going to show you. So um, all of those things, really that one person was really who made it happen. But I had also been a part of a very publicly humiliating, you know, statutory rape at 15 right before I decided to do all that, and nobody believed me. But um, DNA proved me right, and it was five guys. And this was in a small, small country town. It was so small, all three country towns had to come together to make one high school. It was my freshman year in high school, and it was five guys, and we had went to this party. And remember, like, nobody, I did what I wanted to do. I didn't have any, like, nobody watching over me. So I go to this party, I'm drinking. I'd never touched a drink my whole life. I, I I used to see my uncle like pee on himself, like, cause, and then he's like, oh, cause he's drunk. And I'm like, oh, I don't ever want that to happen. Right. So there's power in being exposed to stuff that's the byproduct of something that's bad. But I decided to drink. One thing led to another. They took me in a car, took me in the forest, did what they did, brought me back to the party, no clothes on, completely passed out. The girls washed me up. So basically, all of this happens. I I never say a word, which is the very first time that I realized that I did have power. But someone else, like I go to school the next day and we're all playing volleyball and I start to, you know, have blood. So I I run out, I run into the locker room and I'm like bawling. I'm like, you know, like I I needed to be stitched up. I was hurt really bad. And so, but I wasn't going to say nothing because I just, I wanted this to go away. I'm like, I messed up. Again, my mind rationalized it as, Everybody thinks this of me already. Now I'm proving them right. Like, I got to keep, I got to bury this. The girl runs in that washed me off. And she's like, I knew this was going to happen. Are you okay? They raped you. They brought you back to my house. Yelling. Everybody runs in the locker room. She's crying. All the girls are like, what happened? Some of the girls, it's their boyfriend. Two of them. So they want to fight me because they think I'm, I'm like, So there's something that a school teacher has to do, which is called being a mandated reporter. So she, one of my, my coach has to tell the principal, my principal has to tell the nurse, the nurse has to call the police. The police have to call my foster parents, which at the time was one of my grandmothers um, who had took me in. And that right there, kind of like, I got to get out this town. Mm. I got to get away from everybody and I'm ruined. But I appreciate them now that I look back for being a mandated reporter because they got me the proper medical attention that I needed. I had to get 26 stitches. Um, I still sometimes wake up and think that somebody's on top of me. Like I have these vivid dreams where it's like I'm asleep, but I, I wake up and I can't get up. And it's like somebody's on top of me. And the only thing I could do is like go back to sleep. And it happens every now and then. But, you know, that stemmed all of my disbelief in myself and also my belief in myself. So it made me feel like, one, I have to run away from this small town. I have to, like, I, I messed up their life and I don't know how to fix that because they got prosecuted, prosecuted. The woman who threw the house party went to jail for over a year. The girls were prosecuted for washing me off. I mean, we, everybody told the truth except the guys, but DNA was found. So that case really set me off. And I don't think I've ever told that story publicly, but that's literally as I'm thinking through in honesty, you know, just sharing with you, that case is what prompted everything for me to get away and to prove everybody wrong and to change my life and to be in control. So the fact that I went and met these women that I trusted because it was women. I didn't trust men, but I I thought I could trust women. That's what catapulted me into trafficking. And when it happened and started, I'm like, my body's ruined anyway. It's like, nobody cares. One of the things that, like, 
hits home for me and what you're saying is there is and, and that's you know that's just such a tremendously painful experience yeah and and you think about those moments and the commonality of it all yeah and you know something i have shared publicly is like i was molested as a child and you see this happen again and again okay. and in communities like ours and yeah families like ours and schools like ours and it's like but why and then you go hey well this is both a generational and genetic and an energetic experience yeah. that precedes us. Mm -hmm. Like it goes back thousands of years. And you're just like, okay, well, sometime, and this is a real way to phrase it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About this a lot. I'm go like, it's the inevitability of the experience of the life of the people who grow up how we grow up. Yeah. It's so unbelievably common that I use the word inevitability. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking because you're here and you're like, okay, well, you know, we we then learn to not trust. We learn to not love. We put up yep. these big barriers. Many of us, and I include myself in this, to cope with it, it's drugs, it's alcohol, it's sex, it's yeah. gambling, it's addiction, it's driving 150 miles on the highway, yeah. an hour on the highway, it's doing all these crazy, crazy things. And yet still there's this element for some of us where you come out the other side of it with resilience. Yes. But that takes a long time. Years. Right? My whole life much work to get there yes and so now you're in this position where you've made a decision you're going to emancipate yourself you luckily if you go look at resilience research yeah it always points to this concept of there's one person who supports you the chances of you finding success are exponential versus some of these kids who have no one and so even one counselor i mean that's a big deal and i always yeah. point to you know one of my teachers mr hollingsworth who still listens to the show sometimes cornerstone because he sat down with me one day he goes you're not supposed to be here. yeah right and he just saw something in me wow when i didn't right and that, yeah. was a, that was a really really big deal and so now here you are you're facing a reality that is almost impossible to make tangible because you're there's no way that you don't become dissociated from something like that. yeah right there's no way I, you right obviously yeah but the thing that i think about is the autonomic response that our bodies have to that amount of stress is yes. you to disappear yes it's how you cope yes was this a part of the experience for yeah. you what was that so i had to i knew that this small i i looked at the people around me everybody in that small town either you go to college you make it out or you work at a local place um i feel like if i wouldn't have went through that I would have been one of those girls who would have stayed there and kind of went into the same trajectory of what I saw other people doing because I didn't I didn't experience anything else. But when that happened to me, I knew I had to run far away because one I didn't want to be associated with that that story that that I didn't want people to know that about me and then I also didn't want to be hurt. I didn't want to die. I, I really thought that they would fight me or try to hurt like I'm that these were division 1A state champions that had already went to college and came back for homecoming four of them lost their scholarship because of decisions they made but that little 15 year old girl that was because of decisions that i made so i felt like i was i i felt like i messed up everybody's life i felt like i was the worst thing to happen in that town and if i had left it then that they would be better without me and that I could go and I could reinvent myself. And that's what I did. So when I say reinvent, my story, like after that, they're like, what's your, I'm Shmitra, you know, before they called me Nene. That was my nickname because my middle name's Janae. So I changed my name. I'm like, I'm going to use my birth name, Shmitra Gonzalez. I'm going to emancipate myself. Now I'm legally grown. I'm going to get a job. Sonic driving's right across the street from my school. I'm going to go to Sonic and get a job. I'm going to sign myself into school. What school? I don't know. I'm going to pick a school based on where I could get it, stay in a shelter or somewhere. So, like, I got a bus ticket to Dallas. <laughs> and that was it. How far away was Dallas from that town? Dal so this was a, a small town called Garwood, Texas. And it's, like, 45 minutes outside of Houston. So, honestly, to me, like, Dallas was, like, the big city, you know, right? Houston was still too close. So Dallas was the next big thing in, the, in Texas. So um, I and my sister also went to UNT. I forgot that part. 
So I felt like I, I would have some support there. So I have an older sister. My mom got pregnant at 11. She had her at 12. And my older sister has a PhD. She has, um, she's married. Um, she has three kids, a husband, same family lineage. Like, that's big for us. That never happens. No one else that I know in my family has one father of their children, is married, educated, and went through adversity like she did. So in a way, I was kind of following in her footsteps. but um. She tried to take me in for a little while and then she kicked me out. I was troubled and I didn't, I, I was, I was hurt and I did not know how to cope with that. So I was just me. I was angry and like, she didn't know how to deal with it. She was in college. She was in UAT at the time, UNT. So when she put me out, I was homeless and I worked across the street at my school at the Sonic Drive-In. And I would go to school early during the day because we had athletics first period, which is like 645. I worked till like 1230, one o'clock in the morning. So I made a way, you know, the person who owned it, sometimes he would let me sleep in the back. Like this was a struggle <laughs> for a while. And then eventually I got up on my feet and I saved enough money to get a roommate and to stay with somebody. I think it was like back in the day it was Craigslist. So, you know, it was before the pad splits and airbnbs not like it was like you meet people on the internet on craigslist and they can rent out a room in their apartment you know so that's what i did and i mean it was it was okay and then like i said at 15 you know the question you initially asked me was like i think it was without that i wouldn't have had a hard enough why to be able to want to supersede and over exceed and prove everybody wrong but then that also catapulted me into this way of still seeking, you know, suffering from abandonment, suffering from rejection, suffering from survivor's remorse. You know, I, I survived this tragic, you know, situation. And now I'm here. And like all these other women that have been, you know, assaulted have like, it was all this stuff in my head. So um, these women started coming up to me. And this is where I say, remember the first time I trusted a woman, she was my counselor. She was my social worker. She gave me good advice. So it led the way for me still seeking some type of help, but moving and letting go of everybody I knew. I was vulnerable. And these women would come every day, like, you know, they would come in a nice car. And they would be like, you know, how much money are you making up here, girl? And I'm like, like $100 a day for a 15-year-old going to on 16. That was good. And, um, I still was, you know, in school, I would, my, no pass, no play. So I played sports. So I had to pass my grades. I didn't care about school. I didn't care about education. But I felt being a part of a team made me have some type of validity. It made me feel important. And I was always a talker and very outgoing. And their why wasn't my why. My why was, I got to get to college. I got, that's all I knew. I was a country girl. So go to college, get a scholarship play a sport, change your life, you know, get a job. That's all I knew. So I was kind of living that. I was doing good for a while, a couple months. And these women, they kept coming and they were always in a nice car. And finally she was like, you know, you need to come with us because we know your situation. Like you can't be, sleep, you know, sleeping in somebody's house and, you know, here and there. Like you need to focus on school. So I was like, makes sense to me. And then she's because I, I, I didn't really I remember I was good with my independence. So then she said, you need family. You need somebody to love you. You need protection. That got me. Yeah, there's we're, we're going to go into that. But yeah, there, there's a thought I just had. Um, there is a, a huge amount of trafficking that happens in America. Yeah. That people have no idea about. No, like it's absolutely insane. Um, I, I had a conversation with Tim Ballard. Um, probably recently because I'm broken. We, we, donate, <laughs> we donate money to Operation Underground Railroad, yeah, which helps traffic children yes. around the world. And when you look at the statistics, it's shocking how often that happens right here in America. And grooming comes in these situations, low yes. income children, yes. children who are in foster cares, yes. being adopted. Working at fucking Sonic drive through, mm -hmm. sleeping in the back. You know, you're a perfect target. Yes. And, and the grooming that they play is what you're about to get into is this thing about yes. 
yes. is about community, is about, yes. hey, you're going to make money and we'll take care of you, not recognizing that the opposite is literally about to happen. And and I think that one of the things that is so devastating about the society that we live in is that that feels like the out for so many people because they know that there are other possibilities. Yeah. So these women are, are coming up to you. First, I guess, my, my first, like, how do they know that this is your situation? I'm assuming they've befriended you in the <laughs> conversation. Yes. They're starting to maybe do nice gestures for you. Yeah. What was the framework of this starting to transpire? I talk a lot. So I talk a lot. <clears throat> and it's my gift now because I get paid to do it. But back then it was like my curse. And so I didn't open up. But when I do, I tell everything and I tell the truth. I speak from spirit. So like, I don't remember anything I've said today. I'm just speaking from my heart. I'm just speaking, you know, with my intention to get people's attention to spread awareness by using my story on other young girls who are going through what I've been going through. Right. So back then, <clears throat> same intention. I had these women coming up to me and um, they didn't know at first. They just were like, they, first of all, they saw me there every day. Like, what student works every day? Mm -hmm. um, I worked, like, seven days a week, honestly. And some days I would work and just do, like, my boss relationships. Um, he was a very good man. His name was Justin. I, I wish I could find him and just hug him because he did a lot for me. But he sometimes, as a child, you know you can't work over a specific number of hours. So I would work off the clock for free just to get my tips. I would just run the, the food just to get tips. So, cause I didn't want to be on the clock getting paid and then he gets in trouble, but I worked every day. So that was the first thing. The second thing was, I think that now that I understand energy, there is a light in me and there's a light in certain individuals like myself that attracts everything. And it's the happiness. It's the bubble. Like I was on rollerblades. Like I was always really happy. <laughs> like it just, I didn't carry depression with me. I didn't care. So it wasn't even that they saw that it was when I opened my mouth and I started to, cause like this is over a course of months. That's what I want people to understand. And I'm a young girl. I'm barely getting by, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at what I am, what I'm doing. I found a system that works, but these girls were pulling up in Rolls Royces, Maseratis, Lamborghinis. Like this is not a, this is, I'm thinking that they're millionaires, that they're, they're made it in life. And they took an interest in me and they want to help me to get there. But it was all a facade. And so once they, you know, of course they would ask me certain questions. And that's why I say, be careful. I talked to my daughter, be careful of the questions that people ask you because people ask you stuff to pull stuff out of you. That's actually a great, you know, session. Like if we're doing a podcast or if I'm mentoring you or coaching you, I, I need you to pull it out of you because you know best what you need to do. But some people are predators and they're just looking for prey. Mm -hmm. And one thing you say will trigger them. And now once they're locked on you, they're locked. And I saw this happen over and over and over after I got into the space. He recruits. It's a train the trainer model. It's a recruitment model where girls go out. All those girls did was recruit for him. And they would go to schools when school got let out and post up. They would go to jobs that were close to schools because they know little girls stay there. They would they had an adoption attorney that now I know these things now that I'm older because I could play back in my light in my head. That's what that was. A private doctor that came to the house. Brothels, people that owned um hotels, rent like they knew owners. So like this was a huge operation. And I very rarely saw anybody but white and Asian men, a couple Indians. It wasn't, it wasn't a black ran operation. So I don't know how to explain that to people because all culturally they see black as kind of like pimping. You know, there's this, it's in music that men can pimp women and do, like, that's not what that was. This was a system. This was a, a system that operated like a business. He told me. He said, "So basically, not to go too far into it, but I'll get back to the business part of it and how the operation was ran once I got inside of it. But the grooming, 
they groomed me for months. They would give me a hundred dollars. Hundred dollar tip, like I'm thinking I'm like <laughs> I'm making money. So I'm like, first of all, now I'm trusting you because you're giving me money. Second thing was there were women. The thing that got me, I told you, they said I, like you need to be part of our family. They didn't tell me nothing. Like I never, and then I didn't think to ask the questions. So that's how that's what got me. And then once I met Snake, his name is Snake, and of course his name is Snake. Uh, of course his name right. is Snake. Should be the first time. <laughs> that should be the first time. But um, he was, he looked like your complexion. Maybe he was from Dominican Republic, Cuba. I don't know where he was from, but he was beautiful and he had beautiful hair and he was very soft spoken. He wasn't mean. He wasn't vicious. Like those things would trigger me. You know, he was, it's like a father figure in my brain at that time. And he would kind of like talk to me. He, he talked to me one time. And um, he did, you know, have sex with me one time, never again. And he did that. The, he did that with every girl. I didn't know that at the time, but I thought I was special. And then he was gone. So to me, he explained the rules. Like me and you sitting down right here. I come in. He was like, "How you doing, beautiful?" I was like, "I'm good." Like I was really shy, so you know, I was like, "I'm good." Like you. Know, I just thank you so much for, you know, giving me an opportunity to come and be a part of, you know, what you guys do here. Like, I, I just, I've been on my own for so long. Like, I always wanted a father figure. Like, I just, I'm so grateful for you. That was what I said to him before I knew anything. That's what I thought until I was 27 years old. I'll, I'll explain that later. But, um, you know, long story short, he takes me in the room, candles, like, does stuff to me at, at a 15 year I never had happen to me. You know, he does everything. And I'm just like blown away. And we lay in a bed and he tells me the rules. He's like, so this is how I go, you know. And uh, he called me addiction. He said that I had an addictive um, personality, like addicting, you know, like a thing that like if you see, if you see me once that uh, you'll, you know, want to say something or he said a second chance beauty. That was addictive. Like, that was what his words were to me. So we're laying in bed, and he's, like, telling me the rules. He's like, look, baby girl, you don't have to do nothing you don't want to do. Lie. Um, but you have to do what you got to do to make sure that the family is taken care of because we're a family. We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor Mills. Dot com, where if you go to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50, you can get 50% off your first order. That's factormills.com slash unbroken50. If you're like me and you are a person who is busy trying to create a life, heal, work on their health, wealth, and relationships, and not to mention deal with the day-to-days of normal life, you do not have time to be going to the grocery store and trying to figure out what you're going to cook every single day of the week. In fact, one time I did the math and I realized I was spending over 15 hours a week at the grocery store and cooking. When I added factor, I got to use that time for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my community, and for my business. And so if you're in the place where you need some more support in the kitchen, head to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50 to get 50% off. So I'm like, okay, like what do I got to do? He was like, you young, you know, you, you got a certain type. He was like, so basically you go and you just waitress. You go to poker matches. He said, I got a lot of rich friends. They, you just got to take care of them. I'm like, okay. <clears throat> poker. I waitress. I give out drinks. First couple months, that's what I did. Has a team meeting. A hundred plus women. I don't think people really understand how big this is. He had a multi-million dollar mansion. He had cars everywhere. Drivers. House moms, which a house mom is somebody who, she don't do none of the work, but she's older, probably something's wrong with her. I don't know how she becomes that. But like, that's what I thought I would retire as a house mom because I could take care of the women. Like, that was my brain. He said, all of y'all are independent contractors. Say it with me. Independent contractors. Independent contractors. So y'all work based off contracts. 
y'all rich, all y'all wealthy. So, I mean, and my bro, I'm like, but we never got a, a dime. Mm -hmm. I never touched a penny of the money. My fee per night was $2,500 every night. One man is 1000 to 1500 maybe 2500 if he's a high roller. This ain't no pedal nickel and dime on the on the strip walk in 40 to, this is like the highest of the highs that are coming to deal with us and it's very exclusive everybody's name was john everybody's name was john no matter who they were our name was the name that was given us to in the house my name was addiction my friend's name was cinnabons that started off with going poker and stuff like that was cool then he he said that meeting he's like y'all are independent contractors he was like we got this new drug we about to go level up now he said everybody you know you take it talk to the doctor he's gonna give it to you it help you forget because now we about to be making big money i'm like okay cool well, i don't gotta remember it anyways so that's when he started taking us to these brothels we go in a room it's like um Look like a sauna, like from what I can remember, it was like a like a, a maybe a massage sauna in the front, but in the back would be these rooms. They give you a pill, go you, whatever happened, you wake up, go home, shower, do your thing, do it again the next day. First, it was like for me, I went to school. My thing was as long as I could go to school, and I could play sports, I'm You're good. Still I'm still in high school. So now I'm about 16. So 15, I, I was, it was around summertime when I joined. So my birthday's in July, so I turned 16. So from 16 to 17, I'll say it was kind of more so the waitressing and, you know, he introduced the Molly and like, it was Molly now that I, I know what that drug is now. But he introduced that to us and we started going into the rooms. It started affecting my grades and it started affecting me being able to play sports. So I'm, I, I beg him. I'm like, please, I'll do anything. I just, I can't take that no more. So then I was doing it sober. Mm -hmm. So now I'm more conscious of what's going on and it don't feel right, but I'm doing it for my sisters. Because if one of us come up short, I always made the most money. So I always was giving out money. I felt valuable in what I could give. And you're part of the family. Because I'm part of the family. And that's, that's the whole trick, right? And that's the whole trick. It's the whole game. And, and I think that's the thing people don't understand is like you, you see this. So I have Nick Nanton on. And yeah. Nick, Nick um, is a documentary filmmaker. He's wow. a horrible human being. And um, he was the documentary filmmaker for Operation Troussant, which is mm. about saving these child, these child prostitutes in, in Haiti. Ugh. And he, this is the same conversation. Mm -hmm. Like uh, whether it's here in the States or globally, it's always. <clears throat> these people these children who are in the world alone feeling like they have family and you know obviously i think we can go into the, the, the depths and the crux of this but yeah yeah there there's something the reason why i wanted and gave you the space to explain that because i want people to understand like this was happening while you're in high school in this in dallas texas in one of the biggest major metropolises yeah in all of america yeah millions and millions of dollars are being trafficked through this yeah. And girls every single day yeah and you're trying to figure out how to live yeah. and, and making no money off of this thing that's being yeah. you've got i mean i'm sure I mean, politicians celebrities yeah. athletes people who are famous walking in and out of these rooms and you you're walking away with nothing yeah and so i want to fast forward a little bit to yeah. the to the transition yes because I, I think this is really important yes and a lot of it will tie into the other side of the story and what you do now yes what what was the catalyst for you pulling yourself out of this? What yes. did that look like? Yes. And what were some of the first steps that you took to really getting your sovereign, sovereignty after? Step one, my best friend overdosed. I had stopped taking the drugs. She kept taking them. She didn't want to remember. She didn't go to school. She was 13 at the time. Her name was Cinnabons. And I bunked with her. So... She came home. She was like, my head hurt. I'm not feeling good. So we go to sleep. I wake up. I'm like, Cinnabons, get up. I'm about to go to school. I'm like, Cinnabons, get up. Like, I'm shaking her. She never wakes up. So I call the house mom. <clears throat> I'm like, something wrong with Cinnabons. She's like, go to school. We're going to take care of it. I never saw Cinnabons again. 
Strike one. I didn't care about myself, but I cared about her. She was young. She came in when she was 10 years old. She it was like year three. I was like 17. I was kind of over it, but I knew I had already finished high school. I, you know, I didn't graduate, but I finished. I took my ACT, SAT. I finished all my courses, you know, 12th grade. You really just go to go, you know, in some in some high schools, especially if you did all your uh, credits that you needed. So I just was over it. Like I was he was telling me that I was going to be the next porn star. So I thought that that was going to be my life. So I was like done with school. Didn't really care about myself, but I cared about Cinnabons. So when I saw that happen to her for the first time in my head, I was like, that could have been me. Nobody would have knew where I was at. None of my family, like at that time I had a baby. <laughs> I had, you know, I had a baby as well when I was 17 from being trafficked. I didn't know who the father was, but I kept her. And um, thank God that there was a woman who, I mean, her name's Cynthia. And um, her son liked me, so we had been kind of court. But I couldn't really have a normal life doing that. So she took my baby in. So like I'm there and I'm kind of like that was a strike too. It's like now I have a child from this. Like how am I going to tell her this? My best friend dies. I don't know where she's at and nobody will tell me anything. Matter of fact, that's the first time that snake slapped me and put me in the dungeon. Because, you know, they have like basements. We call them the dungeon, but they have basements. I didn't have no food for three days because he's, I was asking the girls what happened. And he said that I was being messy. That was kind of strike because he had never hit me. That was my thing. Like, that triggered me. So now I'm like, okay, you hit me. I got a child from this, which means that you're not even making sure these men protect themselves if I'm not conscious. That's what I thought. I'm like, you couldn't even make sure they protect themselves, right? And then three was like, um, I remember going to school and somebody was like, you look tired. Like, they would always tell me I look tired. Because I never like to look at myself like that. Like, I always thought I was so beautiful. Remember, I was beautiful. I was radiant. I had energy. So I'm like, damn, I don't know who I am anymore. And so there was a pastor of a church who came in and infiltrated our system. That was strike. That was what got me out of it. But those three things leading up to that is what made me talk. Same way I got in it is the same way I got out of it. Mm. I opened my mouth. Because remember, we never supposed to talk. But I was fed up and he came in and I, he never, I liked him. His name was Coach. I'm going to say Coach just to be safe because he's recently passed. But, and, you know, everybody knows who knows me knows. But he would come in and he wouldn't make me do the stuff that I had to do for other people, if that makes sense. He wasn't innocent, although he infiltrated it. Like, I, I got to be real about that, too, because I don't lie. Now, when it comes to this, um... He, I used to protect him and then God was like, you have to tell the truth because he was a minister. And like, it was also, I was vulnerable too, but he didn't make me do everything. So I just did stuff that wasn't, you know, like just dancing and he would do little stuff to me, but I, he never penetrated me. So I thought I trusted him. You know, I felt like he was, he had good intention. He would always ask me these questions and I felt like he was like five oh. So I was like. But then he, what he did with me made me trust him. Because if you're a police, you ain't about to do this and keep coming back doing this with me. So that's why he did it. So that, you know, I say that both sides, because if he wouldn't have did that, I wouldn't have trusted him. And I would have told on him, he probably would have got killed. I'm just being real. So he comes in and nothing I had, you know, ever told him before gave him enough ammo to take back to the FBI to be able to infiltrate our system, except Cinnabons. Like, I broke down to him. And I'm like, they won't tell me where she at. I know they killed her. I know they don't have her no more. Like, this ain't right. Like, I don't even want to be in this no more. But I'm, I'm branded. Like, I have this huge snake on my arm. And all of the girls have it. And so I've, I've been trying to, you know, talk to a couple of the girls and find them because we don't know each other's names. I don't know their birthdays. I don't, I just, if I see their face, that's why I'm out so much putting my face out there, telling my story. I need them to come to me. I need to know that at least some of them are okay. And I could be there as support. That's why I got home for grace, right? So anyways, back to the transition. The pastor comes in. I tell him everything. I break down. I tell him the truth. I'm like, I don't have a penny to my name. I was like, I've never made a dime. 
I said, all he do is take my money and make me do this every night. I said, and I have to help other girls. So now I'm doing two, three bodies a night. That's like $6,000, $10,000 sometimes. And I was a good talker. So people would give me more, but they're not giving it to me. They're giving it to him. And he's telling them that he's taking care of me, but they know what's going on. So they really don't even care. But after talking, you know, just like me and you talking right now, I had people that was my client for three years. It wasn't just always boom, boom, leave. They actually, I really feel in my heart deep down in the most weird way, because I was a child, that they cared and some stopped coming. And that's how I knew they probably cared. But I tell the pastor what happens. I hear boom, 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 boom. They bust down the door. Everybody get on the floor. This part is always hard for me to tell because I was the informant. I didn't get a prostitution charge. Every other girl that was legally of age got a prostitution charge. They took their operational ring down as a prostitution house, as a brothel versus a corporate business that was evading taxes, that was literally violating women, drugging us up, allowing men to come in and do stuff with us to make a profit. They blamed the women and they hated me for that. They felt like, because eventually everything came out. Every, you know, everything unraveled. Snake was never to be found. So after all that, he's still probably out running operations. I'm not afraid of him anymore. He's a monster in my story. And if he ever were to see me or do something, then I've, I've died spreading the truth, right? Not to manifest that on myself, but that's how hard I will go for this. Because you cannot get up here and say that and know the person who was over you that you looked up to as a God is still out there without being okay with the consequences. So, I, you know, I, I broke the operation. Yeah. That's, I talked too much. You know, it's, it's funny because there, you said monster. There's, there's a, I've, I've mentioned this many times on the show, but there's um, a horror film that I love that I watched when I was a kid. And effectively they said, if you talk about your nightmares, they lose power. And it, so much of the reason why I created this show and have, put the space in for people to not only talk about like the practical things and how we change our life, but like yeah. the real truth in the darkness, right? Because this level of vulnerability and yeah, I mean, look, here, here's what I think about a lot. Like there are things that I know with certainty will change people's lives. And that's why we do this. And it's not easy, right? Yeah. Having these conversations, sharing the truth. It's like people want to hide from this. They yeah. Want to hide from the reality. They want to pretend we live in a world that we don't live in. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not true. We live in this reality. Not the one that you wish we lived. No. <laughs> not even close. I, I go look at, at my my childhood, all the drugs I did, all the times running with guns and hurting people and mm. getting shot at by the cops and getting put in handcuffs and all the chaos that I was a part of. I was like, that was reality. And even like, you know, you said something about this made me think there is something in me that I know one day, like, I'm probably going to cross paths with someone I did something really horrible to yeah. as a kid or vice versa. Yeah. Right. And I, I recognize that that comes with this territory. Yeah. But I've also accepted it because I know that even though that's a possibility, I believe because of the energy I put into the world, it's it's less of a possibility than it probably ever could be yeah. because of who I am. And I think yeah. that, you know, I, I always reference the alchemist. The universe is always conspiring. It's my favorite book. Yeah, mine too. My favorite <laughs> book anyway. Yeah. And so for me, I look at and I, I hold space for these conversations knowing that there's one irrevocable truth, and that is that the truth sets you free. Yeah. And so even though it's difficult and I know that, we probably had people tune out halfway through this because it's so heavy. Yeah. I'm like, we're going to have the conversation. Yeah. Because it's in that having that conversation that we get to change the world. Yeah. Now, I, I look at transition as being the cornerstone to successor. Yes. It's everything. There, yes. There's no time. And I tell people this all the time when I'm coaching them, like, if you're weary about making decisions about your life, when you're scared and you're uncertain, that's the best time. Oh yeah. And so when I, when my life changed forever after 
losing a million dollars and being, you know, 50,000 bucks in debt, 300 yeah. pounds, smoking two packs a day, like massive, massive rock bottom. It was in the transition 13 years ago that led to this moment, right? Led to, I mean, I can connect the dots. I did this thing that led to this thing. Right, to exactly. <laughs> on investing in Think I'm Broken, which led yes. to me speaking on that stage and me seeing it and being here was the decisions that we make that lead down the pathway. Yeah. When So you're out changing your life, you have a child, you're on this path, you're doing something different. The, I would have to say, and I'm, I'm going to, this is probably conjecture because obviously I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to assume that you had an identity crisis. Yeah. I want to know how you became who you are today. Yeah. So after that bust happened, I realized like, wait, I made it through this. I don't have anything that wasn't curable. My child was healthy. I don't have a prostitution. I don't have any, I've never been in trouble one day in my life for nothing I did. Oh, I'm blessed. I'm about to tell, I'm about to, God, you ain't got to tell me nothing else. I believe, I thank you. Like that was an epiphany. Because no matter what I got myself into, no matter what other people tried to do to me, there was something on me that covered me. And I believe it was the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm a, I'm a Christian woman, but I went to church a lot. Like a lot of the programs were churches that helped me, got me school clothes, got me, helped our family for Christmas, helped like churches. So I kind of grew up in that. So after that happened, the guy who rescued me, um, the coach, had a church called God's Academy. And he says, look, all that stuff he talking about, that porn stuff, because I was like, look, I'm gonna do it for myself. Like, I still had a little bit, that's all I knew. So I'm like, I'm gonna just do it for myself because, you know, he was like, you'll never do that again. God got you. Like, he helped you. He saved you for a reason. He was like, look, I need you to, sh your story is powerful. I need you to write your story to every college that's an HBCU. I'm like, what is that? It was like it's a historically black college university and they they specialize in having funding and helping people like you. I'm like, OK. He was like, don't you you play sports, right? You played sports. I'm like, yeah, I play volleyball and basketball. He was like, write every athletic director. Tell them your story. Tell them you'll come in red shirt the first year so you can get your high. I think I have a high school diploma, but I got a scholarship, <laughs> which people think is funny. But I'm like, I shared my story. I wrote my story, copied and paste, emailed it to the athletic directors. He, of course, he did it for me. I just shared the story. He signed me up for FAFSA. And um, he was like, look, you go to college, it's the same situation. They pay for you to be the free room and board. And you get to learn. And you get to be a part of a team. So I'm like, cool. I wrote my story. 28 scholarship offers came in over the course of the next couple months. I picked Southern University at New Orleans. Because they allowed me to come with my daughter and have in a one bedroom apartment. They provided security, which was an off guard security um, that was kind of like, it was like campus security, but he would all, you know, he knew to look out for me and Avery in case somebody snake, you know, in case somebody tried, went to hurt me or something. Like I brought down, this was not a small operation. This was huge. So um, keep moving forward. Now my why is. I got an opportunity, full scholarship. Then I find out because I was adopted and awarded the state and all this stuff and been trafficked, they had scholarships for me that I get the money because I already got full academic scholarship and full athletic scholarship to pay for housing and, and school. So now I'm starting to get some money. I never, I didn't have money. So now I get to, I, like, I actually have thousands of dollars coming in from scholarship. And I'm like, people care about me. And I get another chance at a new identity. So now I'm not addiction and I'm not Nene. I'm fully Shemitria. For the first time, I get to step into that woman that you see today. And I just never stopped. So from college, I, my why was that I got, I got saved. Other people at Cinnabons didn't make it out. It was something driving me. And then my coach, the second year, did something that completely, if I didn't have Enough that pushed me over the limit. She let go of everybody that was there because grades, attitudes. It's the HBCU, number of black people. 
She said, two people get to stay, me and the captain Zipporah, which is her sister. My coach had played in the Olympics, but she only came back to coach her sister. She went to UCLA. She had three, two degrees and was working on her master's, Why, like at 25. This woman was my source of who I could be. And she said, I'm going to get rid of everybody that's local and I'm going to get international students to come because they're going to make you better. They come here on a visa, a school visa. If they don't pass or play, they got home. Some of their parents have worked their whole life to send one college to stu- one student to college. They're going to push y'all to be better. And we, I played, so she brought in somebody from Russia, Libya, Syria, Lafitte, um, China. And for the first time, she brought the culture to the, to the school. It wasn't just about being in the HBCU. It was about us being at an interation, uh, um, about us being in a space to where we could experience this, this biracial, this, this international group of women that all had a drive. That's all she cared about was the drive. That's why she kept me because I was bad my freshman year. Like I wasn't the best student athlete and I was still kind of broken. So, but she didn't give up on me and she brought other people that would make us even better. And when I heard their stories about being bombed, the only student that I tell you about, 12 brothers and sisters, she was like the middle. They envied her because she was the smartest. So they sent her to college and everybody else worked. Like I heard these stories and I realized that that was another push. Then junior year, my coach came up to me. She like, you going to be team captain. Me? She said, and you're going to be NAIA all first conference and first district. She was like, and now you have curfew. And we're gonna, and you, and you, you need to have your daughter. She makes you a better student athlete. Because I let my daughter go back and stay with the lady Cynthia again. I did those things. I lost 35 pounds. All conference. Exceptional captain. I even quit basketball. I was like, look, I'm just focusing on volleyball because we got something here. She got new coach of the year. And then after that, just to, you know, kind of catapult it. That's what created the woman that you see today, character-wise, was the women that I played on that team with, was the the transition of me getting out and finally being a part of something that really did matter. And that's the, that's the same family that you were seeking. I think about this all the time. I look at, you you know, you walked in the studio, you saw the photo of me and Tom, uh-huh. right? Tom Bilyeu, you know, over here, put them up yet, but there's photos of me and other incredible people who are they're like my family right there are people who have ushered me into where i am there are Mm -hmm. people who support me who push me who tell me about possibility you know who inspire me to want to be able to become whoever i can become Mm -hmm. and and it's such a reminder that i mean you know there there's something you have to reconcile about your experience yeah in that it's the past yeah and you have to let go of this. And even there is a level of like, you have to forgive yourself. You have to have the willingness to do different things and okay. live in a different capacity. And if you're willing to do so, you'll find that again, the universe conspiring in your favor yeah. puts these opportunities in front of you. And yes. It's like you have to take advantage. Yes. And you have every reason in the world. You know, it's why I wanted to have you on as like I sit and I think about all the time the people who make a tremendous number of excuses for why their lives suck. And it's not that you're not allowed to. Yeah. You're allowed to be the victim. I'm not yeah. taking that from anybody. Like, you're more than welcome. Show up. Be the victim. Watch your life continue to suck. Yeah. And it's like, if you're just willing to do whatever it takes, your yeah. life will be different. Yes. And, and that's the whole game. I mean, statistically, people like you and I are not supposed to do no. You know, I, I look at my life. My three childhood best friends have been murdered. Mm. I don't have a high school diploma or a college education. Wow. Uh, I've been able to do some really incredible things in my life. And it's just been because I was I made a decision at 25. I was like, I'm not going to negotiate with myself anymore. I'm not going to play the victim anymore. I'm not going to allow people to integrate their beliefs onto me. Wow. And I realize it's so much about how I think, feel, do believe that leads to the place of success of being able 
to seek my full potential and prosperity through showing up every single day. Yeah. Through and and it's not that it's easy. Yeah. I mean, it's not. Nothing about my life is ever simple. Never. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a consummate battle of every day, waking up and making the right choices. Mm -hmm. Not not doing drugs. Not yeah. hooking up with strangers. Not yeah. gambling. Not driving a hundred. Uh, maybe sometimes. Generally, I'm just generally, <laughs> doing these these things that drive us into destruction. Yeah. But then instead into creation. Yes. And and I think that one of the things that you've done really beautifully is now what you're creating through your message and through yes. businesses. And I want you to take a few minutes to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So after college, I found my gift. One of the things I said on gro at Growth Conference this year was the easiest thing I ever had to do was get on a stage. The hardest thing I ever had to do was believe I deserved it. So I say your gift will make room for you. And I think I got that from like T.D. Jakes or Steve Harvey or somebody. But when I thought about it, my voice saved me. My voice created an avenue for me to speak and make money. And then it also allowed me to build the relationships that got me the business opportunities that I have today. My story and my voice, which is my gift. So after college, um, I became a community organizer, got into politics. I started uh, learning more about city council actually put myself on the ballot for city council. And when I realized that politics is mean and gruesome and they pull up your dirt and they were even trying to like question if my high school diploma was real versus my college diploma. I like, I was just like over it. So I didn't run. Um, I backed out, but I will run again, but I was, I'll be ready. And at that point I hadn't fully stepped into my story and didn't I kind of was going off of my accolades because you can get somewhere and forget who you are. So I was kind of like, okay, I got a degree now. Um, you know, people know me. I got a, a boyfriend. Like I have a, a son with a baby that I know the man. That was a big deal for me. I know it seems like I was proud of that. Like because it had been so hard growing up. So going to advocacy work, doing a lot of speaking, raising. I was a good fundraiser. So I would share my story and I would raise millions of dollars. I'm not joking, like millions of dollars. And so I remember as an organizer, I was making like $45,000 a year. My rent was like 3,200. My car note was like 800. Like there was no way I could make it helping other people. But remember my value was in what I could do for others. So I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. Like I'm not about to be speaking for free. I'm not gonna be up here just, raising money for them. I'm starting my own not for profit because I know where the money's going to go. And it's my story because they're not giving me nothing, not a penny. So the straw that kind of catapulted that, I was at the Zurich Classic with an organization that's franchised throughout the world. I was their spokesperson and we raised over $800,000. I go home, there's an eviction note on my door. Mm. I call the not for profit and I'm like, hey guys, you know, I know we just raised all that money. Like, I really need help for my rent. I got my babies, my baby daddy in jail at the time. Son's father went to jail. Um, and I'm like, this is real. You know, I'm still kind of, I'm on the path, but stuff still keep happening called life. And uh, they were like, Shemitria, I'm sorry. The funds cannot be allocated towards housing. The funds, you could allocate my story in front of thousands of rich people that don't reflect me and make me feel a certain way, re-traumatize me, and, and you can't give me $3,200, then I'll pay you back. I just don't get paid for another week, and they have an eviction note with three days. They said no. So I, at that moment, another, you know how I, my, I got a pattern now. I'm starting to see myself. I thrive in, in that. I got you. I'm going to open my own not-for-profit. I'm going I'm, I'm to start, matter of fact, I'm going to help other women that are survivors to advocate and use their voice so they can get paid for what they fundraise, 10%. Because if it wasn't for them and their story, matter of fact, especially women who've been trafficked, everything has been taken from them. Don't take their story. So I started advocating and I started creating a, my first company was called Forward. And that's called Focus on Real Women and Real Dreams. And um, it was sponsored by Dress for Success Worldwide. I won first place out of 100 women in the country. So that catapulted me to the next level. 
I created Unleash to Speak because I'm like, you know what? I can help entrepreneurs to use their story to be able to share on an entrepreneur level to be able to connect with their audience because there's power in your story. And I know I'm a great storyteller, but I also can help survivors. One, there's a retreat that I host called Unleashed. So I take survivors and mentors and I pair the mentors pay for it. The survivors don't. And they come and the mentors help the survivors. I don't. So they, they, you know, we do train the trainer with a mentor, of course. But then they help the survivor and they sit there with them as they go through Reiki, ear acupuncture, massage, um, storytelling, life mapping. Um, there's counselors there. So again, it's just creating stuff that I didn't have that I felt other people needed. And then I was like, well, wait, a not-for-profit is not for profit. <laughs> I mean, I could pay myself a salary, but I'm, I'm still not making money. So I was like, I see Grant Cordon. <laughs> Talk about you can make money with real estate. So I'm like, and I don't need a license. So I start wholesaling. So I'm like, I learned a wholesaling game and I do pretty well in that. And then I'm like, well, all my money's going back to marketing with this and it's hard. So what can I do? Let me get my license. That was the game changer. I got my license. I met Sophia Willits, uh, who was, I think I met her at like one of the 10X stages workshop with Pete Vargas. Because I was still, another thing, I started investing into myself before I did anything. Those refund checks, went to conferences. There was a guy named Ty Lopez. Mm -hmm. He said one quote that changed my life. He said, if you want to be rich, go where rich people are. And that's conferences. And I was like, oh, $2,800 refund check, Lisa Nichols. And he said, go VIP. Mm -hmm. So I always went VIP, which is one of the things with Grant Cardone and Pete Ferguson, the reason I even got to be seen as much as I did by the people who were judging and that were doing this and to hear my story over and over is because I paid for Pat Quinn's signature talk. I paid for Pete Ferguson's 10X stages. I went and went to growth conference, you know, and I was a part, I was on, you know, the virtual stuff with Grant Cordone, but I really didn't understand until everything came together mm -hmm. that all of those years of paying and reading and books and conferences and trainings got me to be able to be the business owner that I am today and then getting the licensing, which is being actually equipped with the tools to do the deals is what gets me my commission checks and then being able to advocate for other women because I don't want anybody to be used like I was. I want them to know the power of their story. I want them to understand that there is so much power in standing up for yourself and being able to negotiate that you can do that Especially even if you're a survivor, you don't have nothing to your name. You have your story. Yeah. And specifically for women who have been trafficked. Other survivors, I get it. But women who have been trafficked, they never got paid for what they did. So helping them adv and advocating when I was an organizer, 13 laws got changed over the course of those years. That is what I'm most proud of. Because I used my story to advocate at the local, federal, and state level to be able to change legislators' heart. Yeah. So that's another part of what I do. So that's kind of my world of like what I do. I'm, I um, sell real estate, but I specialize in multifamily because of my mentor. She knew a way to get properties and she would tell me, if you do a transaction with a residential person, that's once in a lifetime. But if you do a transaction with a multifamily broker or investor, they're going to come back and they're going to come back. So, and then, building relationships. And then I'd already worked on personal development. So it really was this array of just work, dude, <laughs> and investing. <laughs> and that's what it always is. It's yeah. Showing up for yourself when you have nothing. Yeah. When you're dead broke. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I invested in my first training when I was 50 grand in debt. And I was mm. worse than this. What the wow. You know, it's interesting, too. I didn't even file bankruptcy. I got myself out of it. And, and it's like when you're you have decisions to make, and I'm not saying it's easy. No, repoed. Yeah, I was dead broke. I was borrow. I literally borrowed money to go to therapy. Yeah, and said, whatever it takes. I mean, there's a post on Facebook from like eight years ago where I was like, "Can somebody give me 150 bucks? I need to go to therapy." Right? And so, and now it's like, well, oh gosh, in this world. This is the podcast. Blah blah blah. Yeah, it was make make the hard decision. Be willing to be vulnerable. Ask for help. Show up for yourself. Yes. Put your last dollar on the line. Yes. Because if you've already been at your worst, like you know what it's like to go there. Yeah. You might as well go forward. Yeah. Your your story, your journey is incredible. Um, thank you. I, I thank you for sharing. And my hope is from this, 
people just find some inspiration to understand that like it doesn't matter this is what always i'm trying to convey mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you come from for two reasons one nobody cares <laughs> that's and, true and not, being a, it's but real cares. but two and more importantly it doesn't matter because you can still create the life that you want to have yes then you don't have to do the work and go to therapy and get a coach and read the book yeah and go to personal development and go to the conference yeah and to the podcast and yoga and journal <laughs> and meditate and show yes. up and eat well and don't do drugs and don't get drunk I do all the things. I'm not saying you don't have to. Have to do all that. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be your story, and that's so much of this. Before I ask you the last question, yes. where can everyone find? Yeah, so everything that I do is branded under Shamitria Gonzalez. I love who that woman has become. I love who I'm becoming as I continue to grow. And um, rather, it's podcast, my um, website. Um, all of my endeavors, um, ShamitriaGonzalez.com. If you're interested in anything that I do with the women, um, we do have a house for women who have been sexually trafficked. We house them. It's called Home for Grace. Uh, it's located in Arizona. Can't say the location, but um, any volunteers, anybody, you know, want to learn more about that, it's HomeForGrace.org or ShamitriaGonzalez.com. And that's that's where I play at. Those two areas is everything for me. Yeah, guys, and go to thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. Look up Shemitria's yeah, episode. Yeah. We will have this in the show notes plus more. So head over to thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. My last question for you, my friend. Yes. What does it mean to you to be unbroken? To be unbroken to me is... It's not how you start, but it's how you finish. And then to say that my finish line is going to always be my start line. So if I am broken, that means I've been, I'm finished for the moment, but I can start again. I think that analogy just, uh, it's what comes to my heart. Um, I started off very, very tragically and hard. And I was just recently watching um, Anna Nicole's story. And it was so untypical of an American story because it didn't end well. And that's not how we end stories in American, just movies, whatever. And I realized in that moment, like, wow, I'm, I'm writing my story. And I get to be the person who takes the pen and directs how it's going to end by the choices that I make. So if I'm ever broke or if I'm ever broken down or break down and it happens just remember it's not how I start it's how I finish and every time that I start over again and get to the or every time I get to the finish line it's a new start something else gonna come so be on your p's and q's and you know you can make it you just you have to keep going and don't don't let your past get you it it's, starts in your mind so to just be conscious of that Beautifully said, my friend. Thank, thank you. you so much for being here. Unbroken Nation, thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell a friend. And remember, you share this. You're helping us end generational trauma, turn breakdowns to breakthroughs, transfer trauma into triumph, and help people become the hero of their own story. And until next time, my friend, be unbroken. I'll see ya. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review, and you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. 
Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program.